Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast, where time and memory and belief have all converged to create a new podcast reality, one that, well, one that looks and smells and feels a lot like the one you came to be a fan of, but one that's just a word or two different now. In fact, don't be surprised if you go back through previous episodes and find that Tracy Twyman never actually mentioned the drama she had with another podcaster in this space. Plus Ultra, indeed. Anyway, I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for dropping in. It certainly is a beautiful day in this neighborhood. And if you're one of the many aware of the Mandela Effect, that statement probably triggered your post-Mandela Effect disorder. P-M-E-D. That's a new thing I just invented. You'll probably see it in the DSM one day. Regardless, our guest in this episode is most deaf aware of the Mandela Effect because he's written what he says is the first academic paper focused on one of the most batshit theories any of us have ever heard of. His name is Aaron French, and his paper is called The Mandela Effect and New Memory, and was recently published by the academic journal Correspondences, Journal for the Study of Esotericism. Aaron's paper looks at this recent phenomenon and why it's become such a popular conspiracy theory and internet meme, and how it sheds light on our contemporary techno-science culture and the influence of advanced information technology on human cognition, memory, and belief, and also looks at aspects of the Mandela Effect that are familiar to esotericism, since both conspiracy theories and esoteric knowledge cohabit the same marginalized cultural space, which Aaron will talk more about. Aaron is also an accomplished academic and has written many pieces of weird fiction, some of which we'll talk about in the Patreon extension, and he's also an accomplished anthology and magazine editor, having put together publications that featured interviews with names like Graham Hancock, Peter Lavenda, Richard Smoley, Donald Tyson, and Whitley Strieber. But it is that paper, The Mandela Effect and New Memory, that lays the foundation for our conversation here today. So let's groove to that sweet, sweet back badass song of conspiracy, spirituality, and the memory of how fucked up our childhood really was. Enjoy. Aaron French, welcome to the show, man. Really excited to chat with you today. Appreciate your interest in being on here. Yeah, thank you. It's a real pleasure. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely, man. Now, I think the entry point to this conversation originally was, at least for me, you ran down your, your bio and your list of, of work that you've done over the last few years in this field. And the thing that stood out, I think that you highlighted the most was this, this academic treatment of the Mandela effect. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you described this as, this is like the first maybe serious academic approach to this subject. Is that right? Yeah, as far as I know, it is, and particularly in terms of like the treatment. Like I wrote this thing, basically like a research project that anyone else on the internet who is who has some academic background and is interested in the subject would have done. The difference is that because I'm a doctoral student currently, I just kind of kept going with it. And so it just kept expanding. I presented parts of it at conferences, and then I submitted it to a academic journal, at which point it was accepted you know, with a bunch of revisions from the referees and so forth. And so then it got a bunch of more attention and editorial oversight on it, which just made it get more tight and and focused and expanded. So, yeah, at this point, I think in terms of, I mean, there's a lot of Mandela effect research out there by all sorts of people. And I've even heard that there's some people doing their dissertation on it or something. I, I read that somewhere also. But in terms of like a fully fleshed out academic paper that's gone through some kind of peer review, I'm not sure that you're going to find you might might find a mention of it here and there, perhaps at this point, but this is like a full the full deal on this subject. Yeah, it certainly is. And you know, before we get into it, let's qualify you academically and professionally, and tell people a little bit about you know what it is you do and why they should take your research here seriously. Yeah, I mean, my if you, someone looks at my bio where I'm in at now, it, it's pretty interesting trajectory. I mean, I'm I'm all over the place in a lot of respects, but. Like I started out, which we'll probably talk about doing fiction, particularly weird fiction and supernatural fiction and science fiction, uh, both writing it and um, editing it. And then I got very interested in philosophy and spirituality, particularly this academic study of esotericism. And this interest in esotericism is what 
prompted me to go back and get a BA in religious studies from the University of Arizona, which I did. And then I applied to grad school and I got into a graduate program at the University of California, Davis, which had one of the members of their faculty, who is my dissertation advisor named Alison Couder. She has been doing it, been working in the field of esotericism for a long time. And her dissertation advisor was actually Francis Yates, who did um, the Rhodes Christian Enlightenment and the Art of Memory, stuff like that. So she has been really steeped in this whole development of, of, of academics looking at esoteric stuff. So anyway, I found all that fascinating and I really liked it. And I got into the program here and I've been working with her. And it's a six-year program on the road to getting a PhD in the study of religion. And I've passed my qualifying exams. So I'm at this point, my prospectus has been accepted and I'm just working on my uh, writing the dissertation. So that's kind of what I'm doing academically. A, a part of my master's that I got when I passed the qualifying had a designated emphasis, which is like a graduate minor, basically. And I got that in the field of science and technology studies, which is another thing that I'm really interested in. And so even though my main focus is religion, particularly esotericism or new religious movements, I also am very interested in science and technology, particularly as the two merge together into one thing, which is sometimes called technoscience, and how that relates to esoteric movements and to religion in general. So there's a bit of what I'm doing is trying to bring the spiritual and the scientific slash technological, which when you bring the technological into it, you get slash media studies, bringing all that together with kind of religion and esotericism. So that, that's what I've been doing. I guess why someone would take this paper seriously is because, as I mentioned before, it has gone through proper channels to get a professional academic stamp of approval, I suppose, is what we'd say. So of course, there are things that people will take issue with or things that, you know, this is the first time anyone has, has looked at this. And so there's probably all sorts of things you could find that are need to be corrected or researched further. But nevertheless, you're not really going to find much to start with, if, particularly if you're like, I don't know, a, a grad student. Or I even had a under, couple undergrads who wanted to do their, their thesis on Mandela Effect, and they need, you know, wh what kind of literature are they going to use to cite when they want to write about it? You can start with the conspiracy literature, but there's not much at this point that, you know, touches on this Mandela Effect thing specifically. Well, I mean, true, but I guess it depends on what you consider literature in our current, you know, technological era, because I think you can make a case that YouTube videos and Reddit posts are just as, they're not reliable sources, obviously, but hmm. they are, they are just as informative as any book could be on the subject, right? Oh, absolutely. And one of the things that I was so bizarre, but, but interesting about writing this paper is half of the things I had to cite and uh, reference in the paper were YouTube videos or blog posts or like a Reddit thread, which is just really strange because, you know, typically academics are citing academic papers, academic books. And that is, I, I fully agree with you. And that's another thing that I was trying to do here is like, it's through an academic channel for the most part, but it's it's looking at and drawing on the sources, the, the sphere in which this conversation is actually taking place. This conversation is not taking place amongst the ac academics, actually. It's taking place, like you said, on YouTube and, uh, and and Reddit threads and I guess what we could call the sort of the popular sphere. Although in my paper, I talk about this notion of Colin Campbell's about the cultic milieu, which he first posited in the early 1970s. And this is this idea of a cultural space in which kind of fringe topics get discussed or adopted or rejected and, and uh, kind of hashed out. This is kind of changing. That's another point of my paper. But Something like a, a YouTube, you know, is that the public sphere or is that is it a, is it the cultic sphere? You know. Well, I think you could make a case that it's a blending of both, couldn't you? Yeah, right. And that's towards the end of my paper. My conclusion, one of my conclusions, is that this thing that has been called the cultic milieu, which is where this term a culture kind of comes out of, also O culture is this kind of cultural sphere where occult subjects, non Christian stuff, you know, is being talked about and and. Then you find like esotericism in there for sure. But through writing my paper and, and other scholars have, have talked about this is that you also get, you know, conspiracy theory falling in there into that realm as well. But what I was kind of noticing is then now you also get, you know, more of a traditional Christian perspective in there in the same kind of sphere. And the, you know, academics are all making YouTube videos now trying to get some kind of following or, or try to keep up with where the popular interest is going. So 
it really is breaking down all these boundaries in a really interesting way. Yeah, and I think we'll have more to say about that later. But you know, let's talk about the Mandela effect in general, just for a moment. I know this is a hugely popular term online these days. It's been around mm-hmm. for you know a handful of years or more now. Yeah. And I don't feel like we have to recap everything that encompasses what it is or, or what it means. But I, I just do think we need to maybe just remind people up front here of, of what this phenomena is and, and how we are sort of relating to it as it's evolved over the past few years as a culture, as a group of people, and maybe just as individuals too. Yeah, it's funny when, when you say that, because I I was thinking about when I was writing this, or even now, it's like, I was always worried that it was just going to go away. And then I'd be writing about something that it was like, you know, a one hit wonder conspiracy mm-hmm. theory or something. And there were times yeah. where I thought it did go away. And I sort of think now, is it still out there and being discussed as much as it was two years ago? I don't know. It's I did notice one ebb and flow, at least one ebb and flow in the whole interest in it. But I, I think the best way to answer your question is to just talk about how I started getting interested in it and how I first came in contact with it. This was about 2015, where I was just looking on the internet for whatever and came across a uh, a blog post that is by someone named Reese, who claimed to be a graduate student of physics, is all he said about all they said about themselves. And the, the post was called The Bernstein Bears, We Are Living in Our Own Parallel Universe. And so I read that, and it was talking about the whole name change with the Bernstein Bears. And the author was kind of positing the possibility of multiple dimensions from a, I guess, theoretical physicist sort of perspective. And that this thing about the name change, uh, one possible explanation would be there's two different dimensions simultaneously existing and some people are in one and some are in another or bouncing back and forth. And that that was the way one of the ways he was suggesting we could think about uh, the, the name change. Anyway, when I was reading that, I I grew up in the you know the eighties and nineties, and so I I definitely had been read that those books as a kid, and I remembered the old the older spelling that what people were saying was the old spelling, and now I totally thought you know I could be wrong with this, but it was there's this weird kind of uncanny eerie feeling with thinking it had been one way, and then it being spelled another way, and then you have all these other people remembering it too. I don't know. It's um, I just found I like weird stuff, so I found that just super weird and wanted to to look at it further. And so I followed it. And then, you know, people have posited more and more changes. So it became kind of this really sort of inspired slash obsessive thing that people on the on the internet were were coming up with more and more examples of of uh, either corporate logos or or stuff from movies, or even stuff like geographical location of continents and things like this. And that they had remembered it looking or being one way. And then when they Googled it, Typically, Googling it or searching on the internet was the first way this notion was found out to be not correct. And then they would maybe go find kind of physical objects in reality, like a map or a Bible or something from their grandfather to see, wow, was it really always like this? And even in the physical object from 100 years ago, like in the case of their grandparents' Bible, yeah, it was it was always that way. But they always seemed to find it first on the internet, which I thought was interesting and an important part of it. So you get all of these different examples, like another famous one is, uh, the line from Star Wars, where people had this this idea that it w- the famous line is Luke, uh, I'm your father. And then when you actually go watch the movie, at least in the versions you see on mostly online, but then again, people go grab DVDs and, and try to try to watch this. It says, uh, "No, I am your father," and, and he doesn't say, "Luke, I'm your father." So bunch a bunch of examples like that, and and it, it really spans into all directions, which I think is interesting, including like you know new animals, new plants. Land masses are in different places than they were thought to be for this for these people who are who are looking at this, and then so you get all of these examples proliferating, and then you find you find a lot of people trying to interpret what's going on, and the interpretations are usually something like like timeline shifting. We've entered an alternate dimension, we're flip flopping back and forth between like two dimensions. So you do get a lot of these kind of physicist uh, sciency interpretations, which I talk about in the paper, but then you also get these more spiritual interpretations, which is like 2012, it happened. And now we have shifted timelines and some kind of spiritual evolution is now taking place. And if you have seen the Mandela effect and you it resonates with you, you are one of these chosen who are evolving. And those uh, sort of moguls out there who can't, can't get it straight, they're not evolving to this next level of, of consciousness. So you find explanations like that. 
But what I thought also was interesting is, is things like the Large Hydron Collider at CERN and quantum advancements in quantum computing and stuff like this is, is, is uh, enrolled in this whole thing to try to interpret what it is they think is happening. But, and then you also have more, I guess we would say tr just traditional is what I maybe would call it. I call it fundamentalist in the paper, but it doesn't have to be that. It's just a more traditional interpretation using like, you know, biblical language and, and using the Bible to talk about something like an end times or an apocalypse that this is signaling. So I guess that's a way to start it. There's probably even, there's a lot more to it even, but that, hopefully that gives us some kind of a background. Yeah, thanks for doing that, man. And, you know, when I first came across it, it was also 2015. And I remember I was on the phone with a girlfriend of mine and we were chatting and I worked in an office complex that was connected to uh, like a really nice theater that mm -hmm. always had plays and, and musicals coming through. And they had a Berenstain Bears like kids musical that was coming <laughs> through the next couple of months. I had a poster up for it. And I walked by it in the lobby, and I saw the spelling was the, you know, the A-I-N spelling. I asked my friend on the phone, you know, I was like, hey, do you remember this book series? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, how do you spell it? And she said E-I-N. And I was like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, they either misspelled this poster or this is, yeah, this, the thing has changed somehow. So I didn't think yeah. anything of it then. We just, we chatted about it for a moment, but then when I got back to my desk later in the day, I, I sat down and I was like, I wonder like what that is actually spelled like. So, and then of course, bam, floodgates are open at that point, right? When you went and looked it up then online, did you find all these other people saying that they had missed, the spelling was different? Oh yeah. I had Reddit threads. I had YouTube videos where people were talking about it and I had, you know, blog posts and I don't think I came across the blog posts that you came across, but yeah, it was just this. Hundreds of people, you know, that I could tell were talking about this and posting about it. And now it's, you know, thousands of people. And yeah, it's very weird. And you know what? There were some examples you shared in your paper that I had not heard of previously. And I just wanted to share them because I thought they were interesting. The first one is the opening lyrics to the song from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. day in the neighborhood. I remember singing this. Mm -hmm. Like those, those were the lyrics to me. But you say uh, in the paper that it's changed to it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood instead of the neighborhood. And okay, right. like that's really not that big of a change though to this. But it is still like I remember singing it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood when I was a kid. And then the other one that I found pretty interesting is because I, I grew up listening to Queen. You know, my parents had some Queen cassette tapes and CDs and I would put them in and you know, they always right. had those big like stadium rock songs, you know, We Are the Champions, which is one yeah. that you reference here. And apparently mm -hmm. there's a line at the end where Freddie Mercury sings, We Are the Champions of the World, except now the phrase of the world isn't in the song. But right. I remember saying that. I remember singing it like over and over and over because I had that song on and a few others just on repeat almost. So... Yeah, yeah, two two mentions there that I had not actually heard of associated with this Mandela effect phenomena, but uh, I think interesting to point out. So well, I did spend ahead. a ton of time. I didn't necessarily try to find examples of my own that were different or, or or I thought were somehow not as I remembered them, but I'd spent a lot of time following people who were doing that on the internet. And some of them, the examples, I'm just like, I, I can't possibly think that... Well, I don't know, like the person is clearly seeming to not remember it this way, but there are definitely some where I'm like, it's always been like that, or, or you just can't spell right, or you don't understand how editing works, you know, and this is a, ty a lot of typos because people can't spell that well, even though they're publishing sh shit, you know, <laughs> just because they're publishing stuff in the newspaper doesn't mean they know how to spell, but we kind of make that assumption. So like in the, the Queen example, there, I've heard some people, because see what happens is a bunch of people sort of would... Uh, piggyback on one of these examples but then you would get these sort of de debunking people also entering into the conversation and so like the mr rogers one the really subtle ones like that i think are interesting and there's not a whole lot people can do with that with the queen one i have heard people talking about differences between a live recording versus like the record release right and you mentioned the whole big stadium thing so who knows and i even i don't follow up i don't i'm not really interested whether or not how true it is or not i'm more interested in the phenomenon itself but these people will try to say like oh you go listen to the live version, which maybe Queen had a really popular live album. On that version, they do sing this last line, but on the album version, which was probably released a little bit earlier, uh, they don't say that line. But that doesn't really matter to me for the most part, because I'm more interested in how this whole thing is developing and, and what it's doing to, to memory, the, the, the sort of interface between internet stuff and collective memory and this kind of membrane wobbling back and forth and 
either changing or eroding or I think I can tell something is is go, something is going on with all of that. But as you were talking, I wanted to share one more example that that has been in my head. One of the reasons I think I kept following this line of thought, and this is um, this is before I even heard of the Mandela effect. And this is a little bit more like what you were saying with, with, with looking at a sign or something. And this happened probably a year before I started. I came across the Bernstein Bears article. I was at a conference or a convention somewhere. It might have been Las Vegas. I can't remember. But like over the last, I don't know, 10 years, starting around uh, 2007 or so, I've been reading more and more into the, the history of esotericism. And things like alchemy, occultism, magic, all this cool stuff, and and tarot. And so this was probably like, I don't know, 2013 or 2014. I'd been really reading up on, on alchemy. And I'd been reading this whole chapter in this book about one of these alchemical symbols of, of the mermaid holding its two tails. The, the symbol of a mermaid on, on the water, from usually from these, you know, uh, alchemical manuscripts from like the 1400s or like... Um, you know, Michael Meyer and all of these kinds of, of uh, things that are well known, like Splendor Solace, all these alchemical plates. One of these plates that it, uh, you see a lot is this mermaid holding its tail, both of its tails on the water. It's a female in the upper portion. Her upper portion is, is bare and she's holding her breast and, and out of one breast is red liquid is squirting out into the water and out of the other breast, white liquid is, is squirting out into the water, she's into the ocean. And anyway, this book was talking, showing all these images of it. And I was talking about the kind of alchemical symbolism of red and white and what this is supposed to mean to the alchemists. And I was like, oh, that's really fascinating. You know, what a crazy image. And then I was, I was in the airport, I think, and I went to a Starbucks to buy a coffee. And I was just sitting there drinking it, and they had a big sign there above it. Oh, and I, one other thing that was, the picture was talking about was this was part of the alchemical tarot. Some people might know this tarot deck. This was the book I was reading. It's a really great book and deck. And I think I think the mermaid is used for the star card, if I'm if I'm remembering right. But either way, she had a crown of stars on her head, and that was part of the symbolism this mermaid did. And so anyway, and everyone everyone probably I think knows what the the Starbucks logo looks like. But for whatever reason, I did, but I didn't. I have no idea why. But I was drinking my americano, just standing there, and I just happened to glance up at the sign, and it suddenly hit me at that alchemical symbol that I've been reading about was the same symbol for the the Starbucks logo. And I was just like, wow, you know, I never knew that. But it was more than that. There was more of this weird, like, um, I don't know. It sort of left me feeling uneasy. Like, how the hell didn't I know that? Or wait, why is that an occult symbol? What's going on? Why did I read about it right at, or why did I notice it right after I was reading about it? And of course, people can have all kinds of whatever skeptical interpretations of that. But what I was most significant to me was the way I felt uh, after that. It definitely left me with this kind of otherworldly feeling. Yeah, I think I've had that same sort of feeling at Starbucks before, too. You know, like when I realized that same thing, like, oh, this is... And it wasn't really to me, I didn't have the same exposure to the alchemical tarot or the stuff that you referenced as well. But to me, it was more of like the siren mythology, you know, and just the whole like motif of being lured to your death. Uh, And that's obviously... Or to me, it's obviously like a like a metaphorical death. Although Starbucks, yeah. if you drink the right drinks, you're being lured to a, a literal death as well. So death watch out coffee. if you <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, you know, and I I had that same feeling though. Like when I discovered that Berenstain sign, and it's this really weird sort of. I'm not really sure how to describe it, but I think that was the the tipping point for me where I kind of realized like I started to feel. Like, I'd not been living in the world I grew up in. Right. That this was now somehow a different world, and I was experiencing the same space differently than people around me, you know? Right. And it's it's a world, like I said, it's not too different than the one I, I grew up in, but it's different enough that, you know, I'm not so sure, like, when it changed or how or why, and I'm not sure how I got into it. And I don't want to go, like all, you know, parallel realities or other dimensions or things like that, because I have an issue with quantum physics and and if that's actually real, if dark matter is actually real, and that's not something we have to go into right now. But it is something that, yeah, it woke me up in a sense, but I'm not really sure what I woke up to, you know, like, so. Just the last thing to mention about what you just said is what's, what is so cool and and worthy of study, I think, is I think a lot of people in the last mm, five, six years had a kind of experience like this. This sort yeah, of waking what, what? up, sort oh, of waking ahead. up experience, you know, and sort of not being in the same world. 
and then it's kind of it's even sort of spilled over in, onto the world of the normies, and they're you know oh my god what's happening the you know the world is going insane and post post truth post truth all this all this stuff. This is why I think it's important because I do think a lot of people it, maybe in individual cases to some extent, but then it, as this stuff kind of spread out of the internet, it's it's sort of a started to become a, a mainstream feeling of like we're not in the same world anymore. Yeah, and I took a step back from that approach and looked at it differently when I. I did a little more research and talked to a few more people for the show here and came across this this concept of psychological fragmentation and, and how how easy it is to break down someone's psyche and sort of implant ideas or memories or false realities, these uh, screen memories, I guess, that you would call them too. And when you look at something like that, and then you kind of look at your own life, like we've all had traumas on some level that we've had to deal with and that we've probably not addressed as we've grown up, you know, traumas from our childhood, whether it's, you know, physical abuse, sexual, emotional, you know, like there's a lot of these sort of unaddressed issues that we have in our lives as we get older that it's kind of like physical health, you know, like if you grow up eating SpaghettiOs and drinking Mountain Dew, like you're not immediately damaging yourself, but when you're in your 40s or 50s and you, you know, start to get older and your physiology changes, like some of those things that you took in small doses, like those Lunchables that you ate <laughs> at the school mm -hmm. cafeteria, like some of those things that you ate over the course of your formative years, like that stuff stays with you and it comes back later in life. It's that slow poison, right? Sort of. Right. And I feel like psychologically that there's something to be said about the same thing. There are slow poisons, you know? So if you're a kid and you have this sort of intense emotional trauma or physical trauma or sexual trauma, that, yeah, that's going to affect you in an immediate way, probably. But yeah. the real effects of it aren't going to manifest until much later in life as your system just begins to degrade in general. And it just sort mm -hmm. of comes back and it opens this up for you, like, I just think there's something to be said about that. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, definitely. And what one thought I had was that the internet is it, like, how would a, if a person, everyone has like to some extent, this kind of repressed trauma for sure from childhood or from teenage years, from divorce in their thirties, whatever. But you know, it's, it's repressed. How do you, how do repressed things become unrepressed? Can they just be triggered? You know, and then if a person, you know, in a therapy session, it's sort of controlled release of this thing or something. But it doesn't have to be like it could it could just be happening in a movie or watching or something like that or something you read online. But um, yeah, well, I just think that you're, you're right in that the, the Internet also is playing a part in whatever world we live in, whatever world we think we're living in now. A, a good portion of that world is being defined by the Internet. It could be exactly the same world, you know what I mean? It probably is. Now that it's, it sounds even funny just saying that it's it's the same world, but this but now eighty percent of it has to do with the internet, and suddenly it's a different world. Mm -hmm. Well, I look at it like this, man. If I am not on a screen and I just look out at my physical environment, like obviously there are some changes, and I don't want to get into physical environmental conspiracies. Although I would love to talk about chemtrails. But like there are things that I see in the physical environment that maybe are subtly different, but for the most part, nothing's really changed. Mm -hmm. And the only changes that I see are when I log on to the internet on my phone or my tablet or whatever, like that world that's sort of been built inside that screen for me, that's what's different. Right. And whatever is seeping its way from that world into this world, like I'm not really sure if that's if those are physical changes that are manifesting or not, or if they're just psychological changes that affect your perception of your physical space then. So we could talk at length about this, but I think we should probably maybe get back to the, the main point of your academic paper here. And there was a term that you used that I would love to define because I think it sort of encapsulates the entirety of our conversation and probably this podcast as well. But this term, conspirituality, what does yeah. that mean exactly? Who came up with that? And how does it, I guess, blanket our conversation here? Well, like one of the things that I had to do for this paper was it, it's kind of broken into s several parts. One part has to do with the history of esotericism, which is the history of the New Age, so quote unquote, New Age movement also. Then another section has to do with conspiracism. And conspiracism is a I mean, there actually has been a lot of academic study, maybe not a lot, but there's been an, enough to, that you can get a good sense of it, of, of, of academic study of this in a sociological sense of what is conspiracy theory. And so they usually call this conspiracism to kind of 
aggregate it and to make it a thing that you can study. So conspiracism is like another part of the paper. And then I have my own part where I just talk about my anecdotal experience with the Mandela effect. Then there's a final part where I offer a couple interpretive lenses for what one, one of the ways we could look more into what might be happening. But when I had to look, when I had to write this conspiracism section, I had to then read a lot of what academics had to say and had said about conspiracy theory. And this is mostly like, you know, historians and uh, so sociologists, perhaps like some political theorists are also writing about it. Well, yeah, they're also writing about it. But it's mostly in, in that social sciences domain that you find it. You you will find some, you know, just the religious studies also, uh, particularly now. Now it's sort of, I think everybody is starting to at least address it in some form, even in like climate, like scientists with climate change and all this stuff. So in reading about the history of conspiracism, you know, in my paper, I tried to look at both sides of the political spectrum, a conspiracy theory on the right and the conspiracy theory on the left. And the conspiracy theory on the right you usually tracked back to Hofstetter's article, The Paranoid Style in American Politics, this was published in the 1960s. And in that article, this is during the McCarthy era, when, you know, everyone's being accused of being a red and all this stuff. And in this piece, Hofstetter says that the, the spokesperson for cons- conspiracy style in American politics is an apocalyptic, militant, dangerous individual and this is a quote from the famous quote from his, his article, who the conspiracy theorists, what they say is not always factually wrong per se. However, at some point they quote, make the big leap from the undeniable to the unbelievable end quote. And that's like from, I don't know, actual subversive governments, subverting a government in another nation to, you know, you know, basically extra, extraterrestrials are, are behind the government. You know, a leap like that is what, he means, but it could be, it doesn't have to be that extreme either. So, and then this has to do with the conspiracy on the right also then has to do with like the protocols of the elders of Zion, which is this forged text that links Freemasons and, uh, and Jewish people together in this kind of global conspiracy through, uh, to kind of take out, take out certain groups and, and rule the world. But also in the French revolution, you also find this sort of right wing discussion of conspiracy theory where it's like, all of these, you know, I guess like coffee house intellectuals and uh, enlightenment people and masons and societies, reading societies, all of these groups are against the old traditional ways. And, and they're the ones who are behind this. Uh, they're against religion, against the church. They're the ones who are behind the French Revolution. And of course, like the Bavarian Alum- Illuminati in Bavaria right at this time, they, they, you know, you can read its rituals now. They've been published. They really were doing that. From, but it, you know, it sounds quite positive when you read it. They were trying to bring about a kind of enlightenment and equality, stuff like that. So who knows how positive it is? It sounds positive when you read it, but when this stuff plays out, you know, it's, it's hard to say. But but anyway, that's kind of one strand of a, of a right wing conspiracy theory. But but the and that's a lot of the times nowadays how media tries to characterize it. But it's not only that; it has a whole history on the left as well, which I think is important, particularly for like oppressed groups. And marginalized groups frequently will, not frequently, but they they do turn to what we would call a kind of conspiratorial paranoid. The par- Hofstadter's paranoid style to try to make sense of their oppression and make sense of the of the world, make sense of um, you know, the evils of the world. So even like Marxism, to some extent, falls under this category. But really, where this takes place, though, in the United States is in this during the '60s, also. But with the, the assassination of people like. John F. Kennedy, uh, Martin Luther King, and Bobby Kennedy, who were Democrats on the left. With those events, there was a big swell on the left of conspiracy theory interest or rhetoric or or whatever. Conspiracism is what we could just call it. And um, this also goes up all the way into the 90s. And groups like the Discordians and Robert Anton Wilson are like perfect examples of this whole uh, conspiracy theorizing on, on the left. But the one difference about them is they have this very playful, seemingly have this very playful style where they just throw it all together. And it's kind of a joke, but it's not a joke. But what's true? Nothing's true. It's all true. So let's fuck with it kind of a thing. Like hacking you know, as a hacker has kind of come out of this. I and mean, hacker mentality is also in this whole stream as well. But in the 90s, this culminates with something like the X-Files, I would say. 
So you have these two strands, which are, which are really interesting. But so it's this strand on the left originally where I think this term is thought to encompass, although it's this term conspirituality at this point, and perhaps the people who came up with it, I can't remember the article, they are also sort of seeing it on both sides, but it seems to be starting on the left. And this has to do with that, that the cultic milieu, which I talk about in the article, this, this kind of marginalized space where these ideas that are not the mainstream ideas live on and get adopted or thrown out uh, and assessed by the populace, regardless of what the hell any experts say, they're just doing their own, they're, they're doing it themselves. And so this is in 2011, at least at the first place, I was able to find this term coined by Charlotte Ward and David Boas, who I think are two sociologists, and they use the term conspirituality to encapsulate what they call a merger of male-oriented conspiracism. This is, I guess they mean sort of more political militant style and female-oriented alternative spirituality or new age spirituality, which is actually just esotericism, is what I say in the paper. So, you know, this is this this article is, is kind of what it's trying to say is like, all right, the, the, the new age movement happened in the 60s. People on the left and, uh, you know, the hippie generation got all interested in East, Eastern, quote unquote, Eastern spirituality, but also occultism, Crowley and all this stuff, and uh, but also quantum physics like Taoism, and they, the, this, the New Age movement is this whole move towards a new spirituality for the age of Aquarius. And, you know, the, the aliens show up in this thing. So what they're talking about with this term is to is when that whole milieu, this New Age milieu, merges with the cons- conspiracy world. And something like Robert Anton Wilson, again, is a good example of this, too. That this is some, And this becomes like your kind of religion, is what they're saying, So con- or your spiritual practice, is to know all of this stuff, sort of resist it, to believe in this or that kind of uh, meditated, you know, meditation and, you know, ascended masters who are going to help overthrow these, these evil governments who are assassinating people. Put those two together, they call this a hybrid belief system. And they, this is the term they use, um, conspirituality. And I like that term. And that's why I went with it, because I think it kind of makes sense, particularly now, like the, with the internet and, and, and uh, just, I mean, just uh, YouTube is like this just, insane forest that you can wander through it's really fascinating and these ideas are just all over that and you do find them again this conspiracy and the spirituality mixing together one thing about that though is they say that in 2011 i believe is when they're developing this term perhaps it was earlier but this was the main article i used and they're kind of saying oh this is a new development like look now conspiracy theory and new age spirituality they're they're merging and um a couple of uh Scholars in the study of esotericism have written an article after that to show that actually esotericism and conspiracy theory have a super long history and it's nothing new. And if they mean female oriented new age spirituality, this is, comes out of the whole history of esotericism. So when they say esotericism and conspiracy views have a long history, I mean, I think that that's true. And that, like I said, goes all the way back to French Revolution. I mean, hell, it goes all the way back to the Gnostics, we could even say so. So they're trying to say that, yes, this conspirituality term is a good term, and it's true. They just make this other point of like, yeah, but it's always sort of been that way. So anyway, I, I picked up that term because I really do think it, uh, when you look up the Mandela effect and sort of listen to what the people are saying and the way they're trying to think about it, I think that that term really helps. I'm not trying to label anyone, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a useful way to kind of think about what kind of belief system maybe is taking place. Yeah, and I like this point too you made from Michael Barkin. I don't know if I'm saying his last name right, but you know, he uh-huh. described this merging of fringe and mainstream and has argued that, quote, the formerly clear boundary between mainstream and fringe no longer exists, end quote. And I think that that might be where we can circle back to the concept of the internet. And like, this is the device or the mechanism that has erased those boundaries, where it's this sort of hodgepodge of mainstream and fringe culture and you don't have to really like wander too far if you're on facebook or youtube or twitter or reddit to find yourself you know like going from a mainstream worldview to a fringe worldview like this it's just a click away you know and it's it's never been that easy to cross those boundaries you know so that's a level playing field i think for all beliefs and like allows for these mergers that you were talking about with the conspirituality term so I mean, that's the term, the rabbit hole, right? I mean, the the internet is mm-hmm. like this 
endless field of rabbit holes every other step there's another rabbit hole to fall down and what does that mean rabbit hole where are you going down to are you descending into madness is that the idea just the one thing i would add is like i had thought about this before i was even thinking about conspiracy theory but just esotericism and esoteric doctrines and manuscripts and beliefs even those you can find super easily online really rare interesting crazy stuff that for the longest time was not available to almost anyone so I think that that's also significant. And I sometimes, I haven't written about this, but I just sometimes think of like, it's also probably part of the reason why all this esoteric literature is so easily available. That could also be one of the reasons why you find the, the spirituality element mixing so much with the political one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I have a rather basic question for you, but I think it's one that's worth asking because I don't know if we've necessarily kind of pulled this out yet. And I don't know if a lot of people who talk about the Mandela effect actually pull this out in like a very direct way, but what are the elements of this effect that actually make it a conspiracy theory? Hmm. Yeah. You know, that, that's a, that's a good point. I suppose, I mean, one just basic element is it's not the accepted, it, it first puts it in the realm outside of the mainstream narrative. So, you know, one most people are not going to buy this notion that we've shifted timelines, you know, no matter how weird the world gets, or they might entertain it for a second, but they're not going, it's not going to become their, you know, belief, their main belief or something. So, so on one level, it is, it is to some extent shifted out of the mainstream conversation, although it got, it kept getting popular enough that then there were some articles who started talking about it, but you know, not a ton. It wasn't like New York Times did, a, I don't know, these don't think so, Mandela effect. They're too busy writing about aliens anyway. So I don't know if they did a Mandela effect, like Vice did one, and you know various news organizations did talk about it. But it's it definitely started in a, as a, in a more marginalized discussion and space. But I think the reason why it is for me is because when I started going through and writing this and, and listening to what all these people had to say, they they definitely evoked the kind of ethos of the conspiracy thought process or, or way of sort of viewing like, well, what the hell is, I mean, not always, but and then I talked about this in the paper, but frequently you would find this like, well, who's, who did this? You know, did the spirits do this? Are they good spirits or evil spirits? If they're evil spirits, who are they working with? And who you find them working with a lot is these, these evil scientists, like uh, the large hydron collider at CERN, quantum physicists. In my paper, I try to talk about three different groups. So if it's like, um, a more Christian viewing of because they're all interested in the Mandela effect. If it's a more Christian, uh, Christianized understanding of the Mandela effect, it's something like the, the Antichrist. This is now the time that the Antichrist is, is going to come and revelation is going to happen. You know, the end times are going to, you know, all that will be secret is coming out and the Antichrist will show up and will be raptured. All, all this kind of prof prophecy stuff comes into it there. But, but they do then have to say like, you know, who, who is bringing this in? It is all of these kind of people behind the internet, corporations, you know, behind, this has been going on for a long time with Christians since the 19th century, at least, well, since the, the Reformation, I, I think. So so that's a, a funny line there of like, okay, religious groups thinking the end times is com are coming. Is that conspiracy theory? But then there's another group that definitely tries to, maybe a more secular approach or just a more political approach, I would say, and they would kind of point to things like, MK Ultra government experimentation on its populace using something like, uh, you know, the internet or social media. So you sometimes get that, you have definitely get the rhetoric in there too of like, perhaps this whole thing is what they call PSYOP. And this has to do with that psychological fragmentation thing you were talking about. So that's a, a, another group. And the final group is this conspirituality, or I would say the sort of new age Mandela effect. And in this group, you do find it, and I, I put this in the paper, you do find it to be more positive. So I called this seemingly on the surface. This is the positive uh, interpretation of Mandela effect, the, the new age idea that spiritual ascension is, is coming and we're seeing it and we're taking part in it. However, when you dig more into that also, you do find all this stuff about the evil ones, you know, the, the dark, what they call the dark magicians or the black magicians who are working against this uh, they're trying to stop this ascension moment from happening. So I think the people I, you know, David Icke kind of is a good example of this, but I don't know if he talks about the Mandela effect, but I talk about a couple people in the paper, if I can find their name. Oh yeah. So someone like Corey Good is an example and you can look him up. He he is having some of his own problems right now. I think from last I saw, but anyway, he was, he, he was popular for a while 
in this new age space. And he did reference Mandela effect as sort of part of uh, this uh, battle against the basically like archontic globalist government, the people fighting against those working with the, the spirits of darkness or of opposition or something. And another one that I was looking at was a, a Gnostic author named John Lamb Lash, who he's been around for a while and wrote, you know, interesting books about Gnosticism and all this. And he did a whole series on the Mandela effect, which I referenced in my paper. And he definitely invokes conspiratorial, what we, you know, what the, what he, he probably wouldn't call it this conspiracy, but as academics or other people outside of it, looking at it, they would see, I think, a lot of the hallmarks of conspiracy thinking or what has been called conspiracism in his presentation of what the Mandela effect is. And his presentation has a lot of echoes of what is also called, what we also refer to as the alt-right movement, particularly stuff like the, you know, the Judeo-Masonic or just the Ju- Judeo conspiracy against, you know, the not the Gentiles or something like that. So you, so you do find that popping up in his, his presentation. So I think that's why in some sense it's a man, I don't think on its own, it is a conspiracy theory, but it, it's in this world where the, all the conspiracy theory stuff is living and it, those ideas are frequently drawn on and used to interpret and make sense of and then articulate what an individual or a few and several individuals think the Mandela effect is. Yeah, and a funny but also not so funny anecdote here. I invited John Lamb Lash onto the show probably a year and a half ago or so, and one of his representatives, I couldn't deal with him directly, but one of his representatives returned my email and said that John wasn't interested because I was promoting the mainstream Holocaust narrative on my show. And I was like, sure. well, I've never talked about the Holocaust before. I don't know why <laughs> that would be an issue. Mm-hmm. With it. But then I found out why he's a Holocaust denier. So that's why he right. wasn't interested in talking to me, which is a very odd reason to give for not <laughs> wanting to speak about your books about Gnosticism. But whatever, right. that's neither here nor there. Well, And what's so funny about that is here's this person that talking about the Mandela effect. Right, which is, you know, I mean, this is like, and this I think gets to the point, is that the concept of the Mandela effect is essentially the concept of someone or some group or some entity of some sort that's constructing history or rewriting history for Mm -hmm. the people that are exposed to it. And you mentioned this in the paper. That's nothing new from a historical perspective, I think Uh people have always feared that their history has been tampered with on some level, but that there is a a new wrinkle to it because it's never been this serious, at least in the camps that you would delve into this with on Reddit or YouTube or wherever. It's never been this serious in the public sphere where this is discussed as a legitimate, real possibility and a, a real legitimate explanation for why people feel the way they do. Like, this is a very intimate experience almost for some people. Oh, yeah. And I kind of had that at first. I think I've moved past that in my own life, in my own experience of it. But I could see how, like, people would point to that as like, well, the world's fucked because of this. You know, <laughs> like, I'm experiencing personal anxiety or fear or trepidation or confusion or psychological trauma because of this like it's just it's almost like an easy scapegoat to point to yeah. for a mm-hmm. lot of problems both individual and collective so no very interesting i mean yeah so it's well the one thought i had about that is one of the places where the finger gets pointed also is and this i think there is something interesting to this is the advanced technologies and what do they do what does the large hydrogen collider do. I know I could watch a YouTube video that explains to me by some guy what it does. I have not gone there myself. Even if I did, I probably would not know what the hell is going on. In fact, I mean, they could try to explain it to me, but I have to just take their word for it. So there's that. And then there, the other thing that's, that's pointed to a lot is this quantum computing thing. And um, I don't know how a quantum computer works either. So I just have to take someone else's word for it and have them explain it to me. In, in one sense, it's like, okay, well, did people have to do that every time a computer showed up? Like, you know, in the 70s, when a computer showed up on your table, did it freak everyone out and had to be explained to you and you don't know how it worked, but it might be ending the world? I mean, I don't know. I do know things like the, there were fears about this with earlier forms of technology, like the steam engine, for instance, when it was being, you know, the tracks were being laid throughout through Europe, it it was freaking people out and people would, would ride the steam engine and go have some kind of experience of transcending space and time. And they thought it was great and exhilarating, but also terrifying as hell. 
and if you ever got into an accident on one of these steam engines um, in the late 19th century or early 20th century, then you would have this, you know, if you look in like the psychological literature of the time, you'd have this fear that it would happen again next time you were on there. And then this created this type of thing is, is how ideas about neuroses actually started to become a kind of diagnosis. So there, there is actually an apprehension already between people and advanced technologies and advanced tech, whatever those are, are different in every, every time period, obviously, in, in our current time it's you know things like you know the large hydron collider quantum computing but also just the internet more generally speaking and um you know even various other things like ai and uh genetic manipulation and all all of this all of this stuff i i think that people do have fears and worries about it because they don't understand it so technology can be a kind of point to like why is the world fucked up well look what these scientists are doing like they're do they know what they're doing you know it's like frankenstein or are they have they gone too far with their tinkering uh, at the subatomic level and shifted something in our reality? And they're the ones to blame, you know. And so that is, is similar, and then you find that a lot more. And that has at least something to it because I do think that people have a fear. Well, they have a fear against new, you know history, <laughs> also. So yeah, people have fear and reactions to all of this stuff, and yeah, then how do they deal with that with the fear and, and uh, apprehension? Indeed, yeah. And, you know, it's funny that you are doing your dissertation under a former student of, of Francis Yates, essentially, right? And yeah. Because, you know, you mentioned she wrote The Art of Memory, and we've talked, right. about, that. We've talked about that on the show yeah. before. And that concept of memory actually ties into the Mandela effect in, in your paper. And you actually quoted some research by a couple guys, uh, D.H. Ingvar and Endel Tolving. Apologies if mm -hmm. I mispronounced those names, but... They did some research into human memory that, that you referenced. And I was wondering if you could summarize what you learned about their research into human memory and how this, you know, may actually play a role in the Mandela effect. Yeah, it's really funny that about the, the memory palaces. And I had never thought about that, but you're right. I mean, Francis Yates is working on, on the art of memory. And here I am also talking about memory. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, basically what I've done is at this point, kind of summarized a lot of what's in the paper for the first two thirds of it. And a lot of that was added at, during the peer reviewed process because, you know, I had to kind of show a better understanding of all this stuff and presented it in a way that made sense with, with my argument logically. And so but then at the end, I kind of just uh, wanted to put some ideas out there that I thought I wasn't trying to connect them in any way, any kind of concrete way. But just to suggest, you know, very tentatively, like, here's a couple interesting things that may or may not relate to this phenomenon and might be worthy of a of pursuing it further in these directions. And the two directions were had to do with memory. And the first was kind of biological memory. And then the other one was digital memory. Because here I see the two converging in the Mandela effect. So the the two people, the scientists that you mentioned are, well, the main one I, who I think is more important is uh, Endel Tolving. And well, if you take his work and Ingvar's work, this is in the 80s when they started writing about this. Basically, the, the, they were the first people, particularly Tolving, to uh, develop the field of memory research, which is now a thing. And he had these questions of, like, how does memory work? How does knowledge get into the memory? And then how does it get out again? And just because it's in there does not mean it can come back out, especially not in the same way. So he started thinking about that, and he came up with this idea of, of retrieval processes. Um, and he even divided uh, your, one's mental storage into into several different ways that you could retrieve it. He had like semantic memory, I think, and then I um, can't remember the other ones. He kind of divided this up, and then he tried to to postulate different retrieval methods for getting this memory back out again into the conscious awareness. And he they even did like um, you know uh, br brain scans and brain monitoring. To and he did. I'm pretty sure he did find evidence to show that through through his lab work th that when a person remembers uses one of these different kinds of memories, they're a different part of the brain lights up. And he, he, so he had this idea that he called autonoetic consciousness or um, autonoetic, we mean self-knowing, is the name given to a kind of consciousness that mediates an individual's awareness of his or her existence and identity in subjective time, extending from the past to the present, you know, all the way into the future. And he says that there is a kind of flavor of the experience of remembering that distinguishes between what kind of memory are you having? Are you retrieving? 
there's a certain flavor. I don't know what, what that means. I guess I mean it's sort of an affective thing of a uh, of, of how you know, like oh. Uh, something happened to me when I was six. I'm going to now try to remember that. And then you sit there and remember it, I guess, and pull it back up from somewhere. And then there's a certain flavor to it where you're like, oh, yes, that's right. That's what happened when I was six. I remember now. But then some people, including myself, remember dreams from when they remember dreams from a year, a couple of years ago or from when they were five or six. I happen to remember a few from when I was like five. So then I want to say, oh, remember this dream I had when I was five? I have to then go back and sit here and retrieve the, the memory of that dream. And it has another flavor to it where I'm like, oh, yeah, this is not a memory. It's only actually happened. This is a memory of a dream that I had. This could also be done with thoughts you've had. Like maybe you have a thought or something, I don't know, a profound thought. And then later on in life, you remember that one time you had that thought. So you have to retrieve the, the thought, the memory of the thought. This would have another flavor to it. Um, why I found that interesting is in the Mandela effect, like, like we both talked about, when people, there is this affective, uncanny experience when people are, are coming across these examples which don't match up with their current memories of these things. And they say things like, you know, look at this map. This just doesn't look right. Just doesn't look right. Or this just doesn't sound right. Just doesn't feel, it doesn't have that flavor in, in the tolving sense. So that's one aspect of it. The other thing that these people, these brain research, memory researchers are talking about is, Tolving also later talked about something called the autonoetic awareness, which constitutes an individual's ability to traverse the personal past and future. So what they're kind of saying is that there's these different ways of remembering things. And we have this inability to, to kind of travel consciously in the moment in our mental space, I suppose, into the past. Uh, get stuff, think about, look at stuff into the present, but also into the future. We can sort of think about things that could could be. And this is another important part that one of the other individuals uh, that I mentioned in the paper, I think this was um, Ingvar's paper, he came up with this thing of the memory of the future. And that's like what could happen. And I was thinking about this. So, so what they're kind of saying is we have, humans have this unique ability to be able to travel within our our own temporality into the past, into the present, and also into a future. And he, this guy talks about well, human beings are always thinking about what could happen and then modifying their actions based on what they think, could, what they imagine to be coming, and what they remember happening. So he's using it in the form of memory, what could happen in the future. But I was even thinking, like, let's say you plan a whole trip. I'm about to go to Europe, so this is what's on, on my mind. If, if, you, if you plan a whole trip, you put all this energy into it, but the trip hasn't happened yet, but it's all planned, and it's kind of all out there. As I'm walking around now doing stuff, I, I would re be remembering that, but it's something in the future. But I'd be sort of basing decisions now, both off of stuff in the past, either consciously or unconsciously, but also this thing in the future that hasn't even happened yet, but, I, but I've planned it. It's supposed to happen. It could happen. I planned all this stuff. Is, is it going to happen? I mean, it is, it is going to happen, but it just hasn't, it hasn't happened yet. And so, so I, I just kind of summarize some of this interesting memory research and say that you know, the Mandela effect is more than just someone like, you know, some people try to write it off as confabulation, meaning that people are just misremembering. And then when you tell them the right answer, they're just, I don't know, too resistant or dumb or something to, to get it right and, and resist it. Of course, that probably that does happen. But I, I don't think that's all that's happening with the Mandela effect. And that's why I want to say, like, look at what these look at what people are saying about how memory works. Uh, there's something much more subtle and important going on here. And with this memory research, particularly linking it to a future memory, there I want to say that the Mandela effect is not only about the past, but also about the future. So in, uh, in other words, altering the past or misremembering it is in fact linked to plotting a different future. That's one way I want to think about it. So all these people seem to be talking about the past to some extent when they're, when they're remembering things. This is also actually making a different kind of future for them. So that's one thing. But the other thing in there that's important is... Uh, one of Tolving's students was this individual named Daniel Schachter. I think this is how you pronounce his name. And he wrote a book in 1997 uh, called Searching for Memory. And it was a really popular book. And it was in this book where the notion of, of memory as, as a constructive process, not a representation, entered into more of a public for public consumption, meaning like this book was on the New York Times bestseller list and, you know, I want people read a lot of people more than scientists just read it. And so in that whole book, he goes through this idea that memory is not like when you have a memory when you're six, 
whatever the heck experience you're having, it is absorbed through the sensorium and then stored somehow. And then uh, in the brain, I suppose, somewhere, probably what, you know, these scientists would say, but I would, I'm not so sure that that's all it is, of course. But then again, I'm into all this, these spiritual ideas. So you, anyway, you absorb an experience through the sensorium. And then when you're six, and then when you're 27, you want to then recall this this impression or this experience that you absorbed through the five senses, which is being stored. But what they've found is that well, when you do that, you don't just, it's not like putting in an old VHS and pressing play and seeing an exact representation of what happened. No, actually, it's not that at all. All the stuff that's happened to you since then, and even whatever happened to you at that time that you only kind of half were consciously experienced or were aware of, all of that is kind of drawn on and and fitted together in a constructive process to make something new. And so when you, when you, in other words, when you retrieve a memory and ex- you're ex- having a new experience, you're not, you're not reviewing an old movie, having a representation. It's something new that's, that's happening. So then we look at the Mandela effect people when they're thinking about these, these altered memories and so forth. How could you put those two ideas together? Construction of memory and Mandela effect. I didn't actually try to do it. I'm just saying, this would be interesting, you know, for further research to kind of look at that whole process. In fact, it'd be better for someone who who is a scientist who does memory research to actually look at it because they could get, you know, I'm just a, the humanities or whatever. But it would be an interesting study to see, you know, what does uh, this whole phenomenon of the past kind of dissolving and not being able to remember it? What is that doing to memory? And then the question behind that is, OK, what's driving that? Well, consumption of Internet technology and media and information from the internet is what actually what's driving that. So what is that doing to people's memory, I guess, is the my question from, from all that, which leads to the, the final part of the paper, which is where I then talk about digital memory briefly. And here I just give one, and there's a lot that could be said about that, but I just give one example of, from um, Kevin Kelly. So those other two guys are, one of them was from Estonia, um, Tolving was from Estonia, then was in Canada, and I think Ingvar is Swedish. Kevin Kelly is San Francisco personality. And he was the founding executive editor of Wired Magazine. And he's also the publisher of the Whole Earth Review. And so he's written a lot of, uh, he's been doing this in the 60s. He's been really involved in this whole area of of technology and uh, society. And he has written books, a lot of books on tools, how to use tools, like the internet is basically super tool, and the importance of human beings and and using tools. But he also wrote this other book called, books about technology, one in particular called What Technology Wants. And he says a lot of stuff in that book. But one of the things he seems to be suggesting is that technology wants to come into being as a new kingdom, animal kingdom, a new like uh, species. In other words, it's actually trying to come into being uh, like the like the plant world or the, you know, the mineral world or the the realm of animals or humans, something like that. So that's one thing he talks about is interesting. But but his first book was something, I think it's his first book in 1994, it was called Out of Control, The New Biology of Machines, Social Systems, and the Economic World. In that book, he, you know, it was 1994, th- these ideas were out there with, you know, like cyberpunk and all this stuff. But he, he has this, some interesting stuff about this notion of the hive mind in that book. So that's where he first ca- came up with this, with this idea. And I think in that book, he also mentions this other thing I talk about in the paper, which is... Um, Maybe he doesn't mention it in there, but in the Forever Library or the Omega Library. So, so where I where I found him talking about this, and again, I can't remember if it's in that book or not, is in a YouTube lecture that he gave. In, it's on YouTube, but he gave the lecture in 2001 in uh, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, and this talk was entitled "The Self Replicating Omega Library." And, and this was only 2001, which is why I find this so interesting. And so, in this paper, he talked in this presentation, he's talking about you know like what's coming. This is what these futurists, really, uh, technological futurists, really like to tell us about the future. You know what's coming. He, he talks about this thing called a universal virtual library, or the forever library, or sometimes he calls it the Omega Library. And this is when all the books, ideas, and knowledge in the world will be scanned and uploaded to the cloud or the internet. And eventually, he even talks about that. You know, all movies, all TV shows, all music, all images, all ideas, and even all objects uh, are scanned and uploaded the internet into this Omega library. It's all all knowledge is in this, you know, this new library of Alexandria, which is in the cloud. But the, but another key point about that is all this knowledge is hyperlinked together. So he says that this is like this new hive mind. It's a kind of a neural apparatus, giant neural apparatus or a hive mind, all this knowledge hyperlinked together. And one of the comments he makes in there is like this, this thing, this library would also have the knowledge within itself to recreate itself. 
And he gives the example of like an acorn, I think, in a, in a tree that the acorn or the pine cone has the information in it to unfold the, the final product sort of like architecturally within the, the small amount. So I think he's sort of talking about replication there that this library could just kind of replicate itself exponentially or, or something if it wanted to, or if it was conscious or, or intelligent or something like that. So anyway, that that's all very interesting. But the what the thing one thing you mentioned there, which I wanted to bring to it in light of the Mandela effect, I wanted to bring up, is he talks about the notion of discovery once that's all in place, and he says that it's not just everything we've scanned because once we've scanned it up there and put it all in there as human beings, the algorithms, particularly now, we could see that he was he was right about this algorithms and uh, algorithms who are you know have gotten undergone machine learning, they are going to generate their own texts their own stuff on the internet. And it also is going to be hyperlinked into the giant neural apparatus, stuff that no human beings have ever, human beings did not see it. The algorithm wrote it. I mean, I'm pretty sure I've, I've looked at articles where they're talking about how algorithms are just writing, will write articles. And, and even, but they also produce like, you know, malware and um, all the stuff that the human beings aren't putting on, aren't producing on the internet, all this gen- textual generation. So he says that all that's going on when, oh, this huge library is this neural app, this hive mind is expanding that at that point, when someone or a person goes into the internet to search for things, they're going to make quote unquote discoveries. And that these discoveries are going to be akin to, uh, I think he gives the example of the discoveries of the quote unquote new world, meaning when Europeans came to conquer the people in the Americas, there was like this discovery of something new that had never been seen before and was not connected to the knowledge pool of the, the group coming of the, of the, you know, the basically Europeans it was not connected to their knowledge pool at all. And they had now discovered something new. And then they had to somehow absorb all that knowledge and reconnect and figure it back into their knowledge base basis. And so their knowledge base. And so he's kind of saying that this is what's going, he didn't say this outright, but this is what I got from it is that he's kind of saying that at some point, discovering things on the internet, once this, not giant neural apparatuses and all this stuff is scanned and all this textual generation is going on that when you would um, look up something that you'd never heard of and you'd probably other people hadn't heard of it, you'd kind of be discovering this new thing. And then it would have to be integrated into the rest of the knowledge in this Omega library. So how does that relate to the Mandela effect? I'm, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure, but it does, it did seem to me that there was some kind of a connection there between because this is this like a sort of possible beginning of something like that because these people when they look up the mandela effect stuff on the internet they're discovering something new so yeah so anyway those are the final part of the paper i just kind of give these two avenues of digital memory and biological memory where you could look further for some of this stuff absolutely man and there is another part of the paper i want to talk about and it has to do with d-wave but oh, yes before we do that I want to let our free audience go here. So before we transition into some Patreon exclusive material, tell the free audience, you know, where they can find the paper to read it if they want to. Also tell them where they can find your personal work and social media if you want to plug anything. Yeah, thanks. For sure. I mean, probably the best place to to read the paper is if you just go to my academia.edu page. So if you look up Aaron J. French, academia.edu my page is there and you can download the paper for free. It was published in a journal called Correspondences. You could also just look up Correspondences online journal for the study of esotericism. And it's the most recent issue, I think. So you could just look it up that way as well. And uh, I don't do a lot of social media, but I am on Facebook under Aaron J. French. And so I'd love to connect with people there. Aaron French, dude, I really appreciate your time. Great chat. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. It's been awesome. And again, I really wanted to to come here and chat with you and, and it was great. So I just really appreciate the opportunity. And All right, man. Well, take care of yourself and I'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks again. And there you have it. My thanks again to Aaron French for the wonderful conversation and for expressing interest to even have that conversation with me. I always love it when folks ask to be on the show, but I am quite picky about who I accept solicitations from. And I think Aaron brought a unique perspective to a subject that's honestly been lacking it. You know, two things that actually stood out to me during the chat, and they were subtle, subtle, subtle things. When Aaron was talking about the types of memory, and he named one and couldn't remember the other. Bit ironic. Also, he was talking about the Mandela effect and how people interact with something and they'll say, oh, that doesn't look right or that doesn't sound right. And 
when he said it doesn't sound right, his audio got jumbled as fuck. I don't know why, but that kind of stuff tickles me. It really is the little things, isn't it? Anyway, on Patreon, only a 25-minute extension, but 25 minutes, that was jam-packed with more weird, fringy goodness. We talked about D-Wave's connection to the Mandela Effect and the great old ones from H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. Chatted a bit about QAnon as a symptom of the Mandela Effect, weird and horror fiction as a mystical didactic experience, the evolution of esoteric and exoteric philosophy in weird fiction, and Aaron traces this line from Poe to Lovecraft to Thomas Ligotti, and we wrapped with some thoughts on the Mandela Effect as postmodern weird fiction and postmodern alchemy. That's good shit right there. And many thanks to new patrons who continue to sign up for the Patreon to hear those extensions. Shout out to Bill, Max, Ellie, Derek, Brian, Ryan, Scott, and Dionysio. Hope I pronounced all your names right. But much love and appreciation to each and every one of you. Patreon.com slash oldculture is that URL if you want to hear this extension or any others. Of course, I have also lost several patrons since I announced this show that was coming to an end in the outro of the last episode with Eric Davis. Obviously, that's to be expected, but there are still nine shows remaining after this one. I'm going to wrap this thing at 144, because why the hell not? Seems like a fine number to end such a project on. As for what's coming beyond those 144 episodes for me, well, this feed will still be updated with what is coming next, which you guys will find out about very, very soon. Until then, though, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.